All right. Welcome everyone to the colloquium. We are happy to have uh, today one of our own, uh, Pedro Vieira. I think uh, probably all of you have already had some type of interaction with him. Uh, he's been here already like uh, maybe two or three years, or I forget. Um, uh, so let me just say that uh, uh, as uh, the usual bio uh, just mentioned that he's, uh, he was a re recipient of the Gribo Medal in 2015 uh, for uh, his contributions to the, the determination of the exact number of dimensions in N equals four super young meals. And uh, more recently, he was the recipient of the Sacker Prize, which uh, means, among other things, that he's uh, rich. Um, he's also affiliated with a PI, Perimeter Institute, and as a result of that, uh, so there's been a very interesting interaction between the two institutions and also many opportunities that have arose as a result of this. So, okay, let me just uh, let uh, Pedro start. He will t tell us about what is possible and impossible in quantum field theory. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So, maybe this is better. Yeah, is it better? Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. So, and uh, for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about something that is not the kind of thing that I have done the most. The, these prizes that Eduardo mentioned were precisely about something else. So this is what I know the list. So uh, uh, let's see uh, what we can learn. It's something that I myself am learning more about a philosophy that goes by the name of the bootstrap. That is the idea that you can try to use very basic principles, such as unitarity, relativistic invariance, symmetries, to try to constrain the space of theories rather than to try to solve one precise theory. So we could try to solve one theory, like n equals four supreme mills, like Eduardo was saying, and that's great. Having one exact solution at hand often allows us to stare at the solution and try to draw more general lessons. But the complementary approach, which is more or less the extreme opposite of trying to nail down one very specific theory, would be to try to explore the space of all possible theories and finding out what's possible and what's not possible. And of course, because it's something so broad about what's possible and what's impossible, the questions we typically ask are also broader. They are not as specific as what's the anomalous dimension of the second lightest operator. Right. We would have to ask broader questions as well. Okay, very good. So to set the stage, let me remind you of something basic, that there are theories that have very different general characteristics. For example, we have conformal theories, that's one class of theories, where there is no particular length scale. So here is a picture of the Ising model, where black and white could represent spins up and spin down. And you are zooming in, zooming out, and you can't tell at which scale you are. You can tell, is it one nanometer, one millimeter, one meter, because all scales are the same. You zoom in, you zoom out, and you find the same thing. The correlation length, which is the inverse of the mass, is infinite, and we have scale invariance. We even have local scale invariance. We can zoom in and zoom out independently in different regions, and the result is invariant under scales, okay? So this is an interesting model, and often these models are strongly coupled in the sense that sometimes we have conformal theories that are almost free. If you have a free massless particle, that's conformal. It's free, it's massless, that's easy. And you can now study small perturbations. So those would be the easy conformal field theories. But then other conformal field theories can be strongly coupled, like those that describe strongly coupled phase transitions, like boiling of water, for example. Okay? So to study, say, boiling water in three dimensions, we actually use exactly this sizing model, where white and black would not be spin up and spin down, but would be empty or full. And then having lots of black, it's, very, it's like very dense, blue and, and uh, white, white and black randomly, it's like a gas where everything is random. And, we would, and it's in the same universality class, okay? Another very different set of theories are gap theories. In a gap theory, the correlation length is not infinite, it's finite. Okay, so now we do have a length scale. So here are the spectra of glue balls. So you have an action as simple as this, it's trace of F squared, that's the action, right? And by dynamical mass transmutation, these gluons that normally would be free start interacting with each other and making balls 
And these balls, they have weights. So the, the lightest one is this zero prime prime or whatever. All right? and, in, and this sets a mass scale, in this case 0 0.3 in some units. And then we have a bunch of other stable glue balls and then a continuum that would be the two glue ball state. You see, if you make twice this value, 0 0.3, you get 0 0.6 more or less. That's the continuum. Here it states that I have two of these glue balls at rest or with some relative motion. Right? Once you enter the continuum, it's hard to see particles. You no longer have particles. You start having resonances. Right? because they mix with a continuum. So this is nature. There are a bunch of stable glue balls and then the continuum. That's a very complicated theory. Of course, we would love to say something about glue balls. There are other theories that are gapped that are much simpler. One that I'm reminding you here is the two-dimensional sine gordon theory. So that's a theory for a scalar that is periodic. Scalar at 0 is the same as scalar at 2 pi. So you can think of it as an arrow that when it goes around, it's the same thing. Okay. But it's like a belt. You can imagine a belt that it's always pointing up, 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 but you can twist it. And now you have a twist. And that twist you cannot untwist, right? You can't untwist a belt. I mean, you just, the, the twist, you can move it left and right. But you cannot destroy it. That's a kink. You see, the belt is up. The belt is also up after the kink. But there is a twist. You twist it. And now this kink is a stable topological excitation of this scalar that moves left and right. You can also have simpler excitations, like the breathers up there. You have the scalar, and you just make a small wiggle of the scalar. The, that one is not topologically protected. It's a small fluctuation of the scalar, like your belt. You twist it a little bit and let that phone and mode move. And that moves along the line. Okay? It actually turns out that you can think of the breathers as bound state of the kinks. You can imagine you, have a, you twist the belt, you twist it in the opposite direction, and these two twists, they attract each other because the belt doesn't want to be twisted, and they attract each other and they form this bound state that's the breather. Okay, that has zero topological charge because it's one minus one. Right, twist and twist. Okay, so those are gap theories. There's something that maybe we could put in between gap theories and conformal theories that appear when you have spontaneous symmetry breaking. For example, theories that would describe excitations of a flux tube. So let me abuse language and call this flux tube theories. Suppose I have a flux tube that is in the real world. I have a quark and antiquark. I stretch them, and there is a tube of energy. And then I heat the tube of energy to produce two excitations that will be like two breathers of this flux tube, these two dots, right? Now, these excitations, there is a, a typical length scale, which is the string tension, which is related to the effective width of this flux tube, right? You can think in effective field theory, you expand in derivatives, like no thickness, a little bit of thickness, a little bit more, a little bit more. And the parameter that governs there is a string tension that tells us what's the natural length scale. So there is a finite string tension. So this LS is smaller than infinity. But the particles on the flux tube are massless. And they are massless because of spontaneous symmetry breaking, because we put the flux tube in some position of space time, but we could have put it in any position. So translating the flux tube by a constant amount doesn't cost any energy. So these modes, when they have zero momenta, they correspond to just overall translations, right? Because if you have a particle, zero momenta, it's totally delocalized. It's a global transformation. So when it has zero momenta, it shouldn't cost any energy. And therefore, these particles are massless. And how many are there? If you have a flux tube, how many perpendicular direction there are? D minus 2. So flux tube theories, for example, would have D minus 2 massless particles, but there is some length scale, LS. Okay? So it would be something a little bit in between. We know some things. For example, we know that at low energy, if you put these two breathers, there is an incoming wave where the breathers come together. There is an outgoing wave. And the scattering matrix, the phase shift acquired when, they, when the incoming becomes outgoing, is exponential of i, the, stri the, the string length square, times k times p. OK, the product of the left moving and right moving momenta. That we know based on effective field theory. We start writing the effective field theory of the flux tube. There's not that much we can write. In fact, the first few terms are universal. And once we translate what they mean for the scattering of the excitations, they give that result. So that result is valid for small momenta. OK, so the outline for today is to try to give you a flavor of this S-matrix bootstrap by answering three questions related to these three class of theories. So here are three questions that we would like to answer. What happens if I take a gapped theory, like QCD or supersymmetric sine Gordon, and put it inside an hyperbolic space? Hyperbolic space is like a box. It's a very cool box. 
because it's a box that has no center, right? So it's a box that all points of the box are the same. It's like a sphere. A sphere, all points of the sphere are equivalent. It's a very symmetric object. This box is the same. You are inside the box. At any point of the box, you throw a ball to the right, and you receive it after some time. And it doesn't matter where you are. You do the experiment, and all points are equivalent. right? But it works like a box. It's an hyperbolic space. So that's a cool box. It's the most symmetric box you could imagine. What happens if I take a gap theory and put it inside this box? The second question would be about these flux tubes. Is there something new we could say about this flux tube that I spoke about? We stretch quark anti quark. There is a tube of energy. Can we say something new about this flux tube that is not just effective field theory? Can we predict something new about, say, the energy of the ground state of this flux tube? And the third would be, how do we represent what's the space of two-dimensional, for example, gap theories with some symmetry, for example, Z4 symmetry or ON symmetry? Where particles, they are not just points, but they transform under some global symmetry. Okay? So let me just flash you the answer, but the goal of the talk is to go through all of them slowly. And the answer is, if I put a gap theory, I get a conformal theory in one less dimension at the boundary of that box. That's the answer to the first question, as I will explain. The answer to the section, what can we, the section, second question, what can we say about the chromodynamic flux tube? We can say that its energy is very constrained up to this term, and this term, it's a constant that needs to be bigger than this funny number. Okay. That's another thing I'll tell you about that was not known before about flux tubes. And the last one, what's the space of, of theories with, uh, with some extra symmetry? And here are some nice pictures that represent that space. Okay. And that's, we will explain what this means. Okay. So is, it, is everything clear concerning? the goal of what we want to do and the setup and any questions so far? OK, so to prepare for the first question, I will actually answer a simpler question first. And as we will see, the key object that will enter throughout all this discussion is the S matrix. So here we'll be doing two dimensions for the most part until the very end. At the very end, I'll flash some higher dimensional stuff. And when, you, when life, when you are scattering things in two dimensions, things just depend on the energy of the center of mass because there's no angle, right? You scatter, things bounce, and they bounce back. So they only depend on the energy, S. S is K1 plus K2 squared. In other words, it's the center of mass energy squared. And the S matrix is a function of this energy. We had this example for the flux tube particles. It was exponential of S. This K times P is just S. Okay, so that's an example. But in general, it's a function of S. Now, what do we know about this function? We know that this picture is the same if I look at it from bottom to top, which is time going vertically or time going horizontally. That's Lorentz symmetry, the fact that I can rotate and swap time and space. And when I do it, I flip K1 with K3. In other words, I flip S with T, and T is just 4 minus S. So as a function of S, of the energy, the S matrix is reflection symmetric along this midpoint and whatever happens in one channel happens in the other channel. Okay? So remember that the Mandelstam variables, we have U, S, and T, the three Mandelstam variables, but one of them, because there's no angle, is zero in two dimensions. In other words, there's no momentum transfer in two dimensions, and we only have S and T, and the sum of the Mandelstam variables is 4m squared, so we have just S and 4 minus S. 4m squared minus S. Okay? Now, what do we know? We know the function is symmetric, and what about its analytic properties? What do we know about the analytic properties of the S matrix? We know it has poles. The poles are associated to bound states or to stable particles. So if there is a pole at position mb square, it means that there is a bound state with mass mb. What's the residue of that pole? It's the coupling square, because we get probability of producing the bound state, probability of annihilating the bound state. So g times g is g squared. So the S matrix is a function that in the complex plane, before the two-particle continuum, like we saw for the glue balls, it has poles, and the poles correspond to the stable particles of your theory. Okay, that's property number one. What about when you reach the continuum? When you reach the continuum, it's like having many states, but they are a continuum, because you have 2m, 2m plus epsilon, a little bit of momenta, 2 epsilon, 3 epsilon, 4 epsilon. So you get, instead of poles, you get a cut. That cut is where you do, where you do experiments. 
Because when you are doing an experiment, your energy is at least as big as the rest energy of your particles. So it's at least as big as m plus m, which is 2m. So the, the energy of center of mass square is at least bigger than the square of that, which is 4m squared. Okay? So 2m squared is 4m squared. So here on the dashed line is where we do an experiment. When we scatter particles, they have some kinetic energy. So the total energy is 2m squared, 2m, sorry, plus kinetic energy. It's more than 4m squared. So very high energy is there, low energy is here. Here at this point is almost at rest. And because this is an experiment, this S matrix here on this cut is very physical. This is the probability of starting with two particles, colliding and getting two particles in the future. And because it's a probability, it's smaller than one. Okay? So is this, this should be familiar for everyone, this is just basic thing about quantum field theory, but is there any question here? So based on this simple thing, we could already ask one question that curiously has a very simple answer, which is suppose I have one theory which is gaps and that has one bound state, so one pole. So it has one bound state, on one, only one bound state, and I ask how big can its coupling be? How big can the residue be? Right? So before I, I show you how to solve this mathematical problem, which is I have a function with a cut and so on, and I want to study the pole, let's see why physically should this have an answer. Because if you have a, a, a coupling, it's like you are measuring the interaction of these two particles. You can think that this bound state is mediating some interaction, like some Yukawa interaction, and you are increasing its coupling. But if you increase the coupling more, 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 they are starting to interact more and more and more together to each other. They want to form more bound states. They want to generate new stable bound states, or they want to lower the mass of that bound state. So given an hypothesis of some spectrum, I can't increase arbitrarily the coupling without violating unitarity. As I increase more, they, form, they start forming more molecules, and I start getting more bound states. Okay, that's the physical picture of why such bounds should exist. Let's derive it analytically. How do we derive bounds on functions, like the S matrix, which is a function? So the very first thing we could say is that functions, an holomorphic function, doesn't have maxima. So functions don't have maxima. If a function has a maxima, the maxima is at the boundary of the domain. Okay? Why don't functions have maxima? Because functions are the ev at a given point, they are equal to the average of the points around it, right? In an holomorphic function. So it cannot be a maximum because it's equal to the average of the points around it. Okay? You can also think of holomorphic functions as describing heat. Right? The, the, the fact that the function is an analytic function, you can think of the real and the imaginary part as a neat equation. And if there was a maximum, it would mean that the point would be hotter in the middle, but that cannot happen. It would just dissipate and uh, it, will not, it is not possible. But okay, very straightforwardly, a function cannot have maxima because a function is equal to the average of the neighbors. So it cannot have a maxima. And that is very powerful because it says that suppose I have a function that is analytic inside some region and that is bounded at the boundary of the region. Then, because it has no maxima inside, it's bounded inside the region, not just at the boundary. Right? So just knowing that the function has no singularities inside and that it's smaller than one at the boundary, it's smaller than one everywhere. Now, that, uh, once we realize this, we can almost solve our problem right away because we say, well, here is my physical S matrix. I will map it by a change of variables to a unit disk so that it's a nice compact region like this one, where now the boundary, like this upper part of the cut, lower part of the cut, are some two segments here, and the same thing for the T-channel cut, it will be two segments. And now I have a function inside the finite domain that is bounded, but then it's bounded everywhere inside. This is a picture of Zhukovsky. It's an engineer that was special in this change of variables because this change of variables allowed him to study hydrodynamics. He knew the flow in some simple region, like this complex plane with two cuts, and he would apply some conformal transformation and learn about the flow of air around some airplane wing. That was exactly what he was using, this transformation, the precise one that I'm using here, it was exactly this transformation he was using to study the flow around airplane wings, because they map circles not centered in the origin to shapes that look exactly like an airplane. You can, it's a fun thing. So Zhukovsky found this transformation. Now I have a function that's bounded but well, it, it's not exactly analytic because it has two poles, but that's easy. I just divide by something that kills the poles and doesn't spoil the boundness property. 
you can ask me more if that's not totally obvious, but you just take care of the poles. And then the, this function can be at most one everywhere, and that gives you an optimal S matrix that has the biggest possible coupling. And what is that S matrix? Is the S matrix of the breathers of sine Gordon, these excitations that I spoke of before, that you have your belt and you have some small wiggle, and you can scatter two of those wiggles. And this S matrix turns out to be the S matrix that you get that has the biggest possible, that has one bound state, which is a higher breather, with the biggest possible coupling. So that's the answer to the, this question. Okay? Yes? Just for a clarification, so you started talking about the, the assumption of a single bound state, but are you using just poles? So in principle, it could be, it doesn't have to be bound state, but so, and the, the reason is that you end up identifying with the sine Gordon breather where you think of it as bound states? But, uh, yeah. So the, re the difference between bound state and stable particle for us doesn't exist. It's the same thing. So we define what is a stable particle is a pole of this matrix. And it doesn't make a difference from an experimental point of view. I mean, what's the difference between a bound state and a stable particle? And if you have a Lagrangian, if you have a Lagrangian, it's fine. If you look close enough, you would see some point back or something, right? Right, yeah. But from an S matrix point of view, from an experimental, an S matrix point of view, there's no difference from a pole that corresponds to a bound state or from a pole that corresponds to a particle in your Lagrangian, right? So we don't make any distinction here. In this case, it is a bound state. Okay, very good. Um, so this is, we, we go back, we undo Joukowsky, we go back after we solve the problem, we got this variable Z, we divide by the poles, we find the optimal S matrix in the, in the unit disk, and then we undo to find out what the S matrix looks like, and here it is. And as I said, this is the scattering of the breeders of sine Gordon theory. So let's just stare at this S matrix for one second, just to realize that you see it has a cut when S is equal to four. That's the cut we said. S bigger than four, it has a cut. It has a cut when S is smaller than zero. That's the image of that cut. That's the T-channel cut. When S is equal to MB squared, this square root is equal to this, so there is a pole. And similarly, there is a cross-channel pole. So it has the two poles, it has the cut, it has all the nice analytic properties that we said. And so we conclude something interesting, that there is a maximum coupling with a single bound state, so the blue region are allowed quantum field theories. You can have a quantum field theory where you have a bound state of mass square root of three and a coupling three. But you cannot have a theory with a bound state of mass square root of three and a coupling 10 that's excluded. So that's how, why the, that's how we connect to the title of, of the colloquium, what's possible and what's impossible. Here is a very simple toy model where we just say, if I have a theory that has one bound state, the coupling, there is a maximum, and it can be in the blue region. And the bound is optimal. Why is the bound optimal? Because there is a theory at the boundary, that's sine Gordon. So we can never improve the bound. So in this particular case, we are lucky. It's not always the case. Sometimes we don't know if the bound is optimal. So you have a case, of course, it's, it's detailed here, but uh, roughly speaking, it looks like uh, around three, roughly, right? Uh, here it's log of the coupling. Nice log, okay. So uh, it can be quite big. And, uh, and you see that it goes up to four, as we said, because the bound state must be below the continuum, right? So it naturally leaves between one and four. One, because we said that the external particle is the lightest, so the bound state must be above one and below four because it's below the continuum. So there is no couple. This is the S matrix. It's the result of the experiment. There is a, this is what you get when you scatter. That's the probability amplitude. The coupling is the residue of this guy. You take the residue at the pole and you get the coupling. That's the physical coupling. That's what's being plotted here, is the residue of the coupling. Okay, so now we derive this result. Joukowsky helped us and we have this result. Let's go to this question about the hyperbolic box. So the question is, we take this hyperbolic space, here is a depiction of this, it's like, I think this is by Escher, where here is a space, there is an inside and there is a boundary. The space is d plus one dimensional and the boundary is d-dimensional, okay? And now I'm going to tell you three facts give us where the third one really is a huge fact that I don't have time, that I will not go into many details unless you ask me. 
But let me tell you some facts about this box. So first, this box has symmetries. Like we said, a sphere, I can rotate the sphere, and these are isometries of the sphere, right? A sphere, I have some SON rotations that rotate the sphere and nothing happens. And you can ask, what are the isometries of this space? What symmetries does this space have? So here is fact number one. The isometries of a D plus one dimensional box are the conformal group in D dimensions. Yeah, that's a fact. That means that if I compute correlation functions of two points or three points inside this space, I apply an isometry. The result is the same by definition because it's an isometry. It's like rotating the point in the sphere. But that transformation mathematically is like a conformal transformation in D dimensions, in one less dimension. Just it's the algebra. So it's the same algebra. It's the same group. The second fact is that if you have a box and the box is very big, it's like having no box, right? I mean, who knows if there are some walls at the end of the universe, right? I mean, if the box is very big, in the middle, it looks like flat space, OK? And the third thing is that theories that are gapless, that transform under the conformal group, can be the space of such theories can be carved out using computers. So we now have tools to say, can I have a given conformal field theory with some given anomalous dimension, some critical exponents? And you run it in a computer in what's called a conformal bootstrap, and it tells you, yes, this theory is allowed. No, that theory is forbidden. Okay, so there is some technology related to the conformal bootstrap of theories without a, a scale. Okay, so we know a lot about it, and I'll show you a little bit more at the end. So this fact is the hardest one to digest, and I'll tell you a little bit more later. But it so turns out that the combination of these three facts, if you take them for granted, they imply something very nice. They imply that if you take a gap theory in hyperbolic space, and you drag the points of that theory, you drag them all the way to the boundary, that defines a correlation function in the boundary. It's the correlation function in the bulk as you drag the points to the boundary, right? It's like if you have a correlation function of points here, I drag them to the blackboard, that defines a correlation function in the blackboard. That's definition. But because of these isometries, then the points can move here in the blackboard like conformal transformations. But then they define a conformal field theory in the blackboard. That conformal field theory with a finite critical exponents. But it so turns out that if the box is infinite, everything needs to be rescaled, and we are dealing with conformal theories with very large critical exponents. And so the problem becomes, can we take computers and study what's the space of conformal theories where all critical exponents are very large? OK? And then that's what we did. So let me show you a plot. So let me describe what this plot is. So this plot has many dots here. And this plot was done using the CERN, CERN's cluster. One of our collaborators was at CERN, and we really needed to use computers to do this silly plot. Okay? So here is this vertical line is CERN's cluster. Here's a picture of CERN's cluster. And the more, the better computers we have, the better our bound becomes. And this dot, blue dots go down, 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 down. The last blue dot, this picture, yeah, this projector is not working so well today. This last point is like the best computers we have. So they go down, 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 down. Now, that's not where we stop. We just see a trend. We see how they are going. And we extrapolate, assuming this trend continues. And we say, OK, if CERN's cluster was infinitely powerful, this is where they go. So we fit vertically. And we say, with infinite power, I guess I would go to the orange points. So I make a fit. And I see where I would go. That's the orange points here. Pom, 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 pom. Right? So for each run, I extrapolate to see what's the energy. Then uh, I increase delta, which is these critical exponents. And for each extrapolate, I go pom, 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 pom. And I stop at some maximum one, because it becomes computationally very costly to go further. And then I fit again, double fits. And now I go to the wall. And that's extrapolation to very large critical dimensions. So first, I extrapolate in my numerics. Then I extrapolate to infinite dimensions, which means a big box. And what do I get? At the end, I get this nice black curve. But that curve is the analytic curve that we derived before. That's exactly the maximum coupling of the breeders of sine Gordon. Okay? So as we go, 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 bigger ADS, we end up on the back, which is exactly the sine Gordon breeder S matrix. Okay? Yeah, so you check numerically. The red dots are numerics. The black curve is analytics. So you see the, black, the red dots are on top of the curve.
yeah, the point is, you put it on, on, on a computer, and the computer has a, a, a given number of parameters. And the more you increase the number of parameters, the slower the computer takes. And you, you, you compute it with 10 constants, 15 constants, 20 constants, 30 constants, and you see that the result is doing something like this, right? Then uh, you fit and you guess, well, if I add infinite computer power, I guess it goes here. And you estimate that this is where the curve would go. Okay, so let, let me emphasize again. The goal is not to reproduce the black curve using CERN. If CERN knew that we were reproducing the black curve using all this time, uh, why do we need it? We already have it analytically. The idea is to show that it works, to have a proof of concept, that by putting a theory inside the box, I get a conformal theory, and I can use conformal theory techniques to study a gap theory at the boundary. In this case, I could solve the other problem analytically, so I don't need any of this. But there are cases where I cannot solve the problem analytically. Well, it's converging, but uh, it's how we fit things always. Imagine you do a simulation in condensed matter and you do a given size, L. L equals 10, 15, 20, 30, and you are interested in thermodynamic limit. What do you do? You divide by L and you fit to see what is the free energy per length going to. You can stop at 40 and say, I stop at 40 and I, do, I divide by 40. That, that's, it's much better to compute 10, 20, 30, 40 and fit to see where it goes. That's the same thing. We increase number of parameters and we extrapolate to infinite power. This is exactly the same thing. Is it clear? Can you say again how the, not, I'm not referring to this picture that you're showing me, uh -huh. the result, but uh, how the gap part appears from this, so you have this uh, conformal uh, framework. Yes. I guess when you say uh, hyperbolic, is it the usual concave patch that you have in mind? Uh, yes. Can I, can I think of the Brunelson type of a? Yes, right? exactly, yes. So what happens is that you see that here I have ratios. What is this? I take the critical exponents to infinity and I hold fixed some ratios. And holding fixed the ratio of the second critical exponent to the first is holding fixed the ratio between the mass of the second bound state over the first. So you measure things in units of the mass of the lightest particle. Then everything is dimensionless. The coupling is dimensionless. The mass of the second is dimensionless. It's just a number that says how many times it is. So it's those dimensionless numbers, the coupling measured in units of the lightest mass, and the mass of the second lightest particle measured in units of the lightest particle, it's those dimensionless numbers that we can identify in the CFT. Of course, the overall scale we cannot, but we don't care also. Okay? Yes, I guess so in the CFT, this delta, this, you should think of this delta as the mass of the particle times the radius. So you want to cancel the radius, so you, you divide both and you take radius to infinity. Then the radius cancels out. So that's the inverse curvature of the ABS space. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So the so dimensions, maybe, yes. Maybe it's too naive what I'm thinking, but uh, so in, in analogy with uh, so applications, we do in phenomenology of these type of things. Mm -hmm. If you take four trains to infinity, you have the full ABS space. Uh, then normally you, so for us, there is no gap, right? You, there, you start with massless particles. Mm -hmm. Or you have the scale of the, of the curvature radius. Yes. But so you're saying, so you're just asking, um, here it's different. I'm putting a gap theory inside ADS. I'm not studying gravity. What do you mean by There's no gravity. I just have a box, and I say I have a gap theory, and I put it inside that box. It's not, it's, it's not ADS-CFT. This has, this has no gravity. This has, for example, that, as I said, the critical exponents go to infinity. This cannot happen in a conformal field, in an honest conformal field theory. This happens because I don't have a conformal field theory. I define the conformal field theory by the limit of correlations as the points approach the boundary. There is no honest the holographic theory at the boundary. That doesn't exist. This is, there's no duality. There's no holography here. Right? So, for example, there's no stress tensor. Okay? Yes? That's right. Because the curvature is very small, as Eduardo was saying. So locally, you cannot see that you are not in a box. Yeah, 
Yeah, so you have to do it carefully. But as you zoom in, it's like the isometries of a sphere and of the tangent plane. They're also different, right? Yeah. And yet, uh, people believe that the Earth is flat. <laughs> but it's not. OK. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, so that's the answer. I think it's quite cool that using conformal theories in one less dimension that we can learn about gap theories in one more dimension. Okay? It doesn't mean it's easy, because in this case, as you saw, we solved the problem analytically using complex analysis, and then we had all these cluster CERN, fitting points, double fit, and so on, to reproduce what was before trivial to do in one, one line in, a, in paper. Right? But still, from a conceptual point of view, I think it's great. Because on the other hand, the other derivation was very simple, but it ne we needed to know where are the cuts, where are the poles, what are the analytic properties, and so on, of the S matrix theory that often we have to postulate, justify, and so on. Whereas conformal field theory axiomatics are very well defined. So it's literally like a box and a black box. Like I put it in the black box, okay, if the cluster is empty, I can run it there. I have to suffer more numerically, but I don't have to think. Okay? And sometimes it can be powerful, because in the future we might want to study problems that in flat space are very complicated, whose analytic properties we don't know exactly. But still, from a numerical point of view, if we do it in this ADS language, we can still solve the problem and get some intuition that might guide us when we want to go back to flat space. OK, so, so that, that, that was the question number one. Question number two is related to question number one, even though it doesn't look related at all, which is about what can we say about the flux tube. So this is work we are doing now with Andrea. So we go back to the flux tube. Again, we have an S matrix, S. But the difference now, it's about a massless S matrix that, as I said, it's fixed by symmetry at low energy, at low S, to be e to the i alpha S, 1 plus i alpha S plus i alpha S squared plus dot, dot, dot. And that's the S matrix between these two Goldstone particles of the flux tube. Now, because we are dealing with massless particles, the analytic properties are different because the two cuts collide. The S and T channel cut collide. So the doors close. I cannot go from upper half plane to lower half plane. Before we had two cuts, we could go down. Now they close. So I only have the upper half plane. But that's fine. So we have a theory. It lives on the upper half plane. It's bounded because there are no bound states. And so we are dealing right away with a function after I map the upper half plane to the unit disk that has a red point that would be the effective field theory point in the sense that that's 0. It's where I expand at low energy. And then there is a UV completion that would describe the S matrix at all other values of S in the complex plane. Okay? So red point, effective field theory, the rest UV completion. Okay, so what would we say now? Now here is a chain of argument that goes from this first observation of the S matrix, and from this simple bound on the probability of the S matrix, we want to go to a bound on the energy of the flux tube. So now there is a chain of ideas that takes us there. So first, we expand the S matrix around the effective field theory points to get 1 plus S plus S squared plus SQ plus dot, dot, dot. What can I say about these coefficients? For example, I can say right away that C1 is positive. Right? So can you see why? So why should C1 be positive? Because you see that in the S matrix, in the blue region, needs to be smaller than 1 everywhere. Right? Because of what we said before, functions cannot have maxima. But if you go up a little bit, you, give, you make S i epsilon, this becomes 1 minus C1. So if C1 is negative, the function becomes bigger than 1 right after you do a small step. So right away, we conclude by unitarity that C1 needs to be positive. If you move in a, in a different direction, you would conclude that C2 needs to obey some other condition. So that's just by the fact that even though we are doing effective field theory, we know that as a UV completed inside, Nowhere can the function be bigger than 1. And so this, the function cannot start increasing as I go inside. Now, there's something fun we can do, which is if you know that you have a function that is smaller than 1 everywhere, one thing you can do is compute derivatives, and the derivatives need to go down. But you can ask, is there something more sophisticated I can do? If I have a function that's smaller than 1 everywhere, is there something more clever I can do, like some second derivative or some probes that use more points? There is, I will not explain unless you ask me again, it's this Schwartz peak inequalities. It's a very beautiful idea. And the idea is, if I have a function that is bounded, I can construct another function that is designed to be bounded as well. 
And then what do I do with this new bounded function? I expand derivatives again around the effective field theory point. And then I can construct another and another and another. And in this way, using these Schwarz peak inequalities, we can derive constraints on the higher C's that normally we could not get because they were subleading. Okay, so now we have bounds on this constant C. So we can put bounds on them just based on unit F. Okay, good. So now let's convert the effective field theory bounds into ground state energy bounds. So what are we doing? We want to consider the ground state energy. What's ground state energy? It's you have your system in some finite length and you propagate it with infinite Euclidean time to project into the ground state. So that's what we want to do. Take the system and evolve it for infinitely long time. That's a big direction of the torus, right? So that's what we want. We want small circle, which is the flux tube, and huge circle for time to project into the ground state. That looks hard, because I don't know how to describe the small flux tube. But the clever trick is to think from the dual channel point of view. Just flip your head and think differently. Think that the large circle is space. Well, but that's a good idea, because if the space is huge, things have a lot of space to scatter, I can quantize that space using the low energy as matrix. Because if we are scattering at large distances, it's scattering at low momenta. So exactly the bounds that we had for the low momenta scattering, we can now use for that large space. OK, that's great. We can use the bounds on the S matrix for the large circle. What about the small circle? The small circle is just temperature. You just put it on finite temperature and sum over all states that you can describe anyway. And because they are the same, you can, you can access in this way the ground state energy as function of the radius. And when you do it, you translate back the bounds, and you get this funny bound on the constant that appears on R once you do the computation. Okay? But that's the basic idea. Okay? So that's the bound on the flux tube. So people are, with the lattice, they can guess, they can show that these constants do come out from lattice simulations. They can subtract them out and can fit the r to the 7 coefficient. But before, people did not know that we could say something about this constant. They were rather trying to check that the coefficient was 7 indeed. So they see that the sign is as we think it is. But I think soon people should be able to have more precision measurements of this constant c. And it would be nice to see if they are close or not to saturating the bound. Mm -hmm. Any question? This was done in three dimensions. Why, why three dimensions? Because in three dimensions, we have d minus two Goldstone bosons, which is one Goldstone boson. So that's simple, because now we only have one particle. right? Whereas if you are in four dimensions, then you have two directions, so you have two particles. So now your S matrix is not just a function. It's a matrix. You can scatter blue, 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 red, red, red. So that brings us to the next question, indeed which was this one here. What starts happening to the space of theories once they have symmetries? That would be relevant also for this case, for four dimensions, which we also solved, but I did not explain here. Because now, as, uh, as you are saying, if I go to more dimensions, say 4D, I have two Goldstone particles that transform into some O2 symmetry. So that's the first example of this ON. And we could ask theories that where particles transform under some Z4 symmetry, for example, or Z2, or ON, or SUN, some global symmetry. So what's the challenge there? Before yes. you go to the next question. Yes. So the, the question two, right? So, so this uh, is a large R expansion, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, so R here is the, the, the length of the, the tube? Or the R is the length. The length. Yeah. yeah. So, OK, I'm just wondering, OK, you had the results up to 1 over R to the fifth, and then you know something about what R Seven. Yeah. But okay, so what? I mean, I just want so what, what hangs on, on this? Uh, so what, what is this? Yeah. As I said in the beginning, the goal to answer these three questions is to give you a flavor, not to give the global picture. The global picture would be what is the flux tube as matrix of large N QCD? Say I take large N QCD, this defines a two dimensional theory of the flux tube, and characterizing that theory, which is like finding the string theory that describes large N QCD would be, for example, finding the exact S matrix at all energies. And here, we are starting at low energy and starting to put some constraints on the possible low energy S matrices. But it's not solving one theory. It's putting bounds on the possible S matrices that can appear. It's putting bounds on effective field theory coefficients. Now, so, so before 
this C, that's all fixed by effective theory considerations? Yes, yes. Okay. But uh, C yes. cannot Until be here, it's by effective theory? No. So See, that, so that, that's, that's where the, 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 the microscopic details would enter. Right. right. Okay. So different flux tube, different theories, uh, different representations of the gauge group, uh, different theories would differ by this C. And we are putting a bound on uh, what it could be. Now, as you were asking, S matrix so far was a function of the center of mass energy. But in general, it could be a matrix. We could have a matrix where we have an S with an index A, where this index A represents the various scattering channels I can scatter. For example, if particles are in the ON, if they are vector particles with two vectors, I can form a symmetric channel, an antisymmetric, or a symmetric traceless. So then I would have three functions, the probability of scattering in the symmetric channel, probability of scattering in the antisymmetric, and probability of scattering in the other one. Which one did I not say? The symmetric traceless, right? So we have three S matrices. Each probability is smaller than one. So right, so the probability of starting with two particles in the singlet and getting two particles in the singlet is smaller than one. Two particles in the symmetric and getting two particles in the symmetric is smaller than one. So all of them are still smaller than one. So that part is the same. This would be like the S cut. I have a, a three functions, for example, which are smaller than one. But now S and T channel cut are not the same. Because when I rotate my head, now the particles with index 1, 1 go into 2, 2. I rotate, and now it describes a scattering of 1, 2 going into 1, 2. Right? It's like when we have an electron and a positron annihilating and producing it again. From the side, it looks like electron-electron scattering. Right? So seen from the side, you relate different processes. So now there is a matrix that rotates. So we have functions that are bounded on one side of the disk, and on the other side, they are indirectly bounded because they are linear combinations of the function on the other side. And this is a crossing matrix. It tells us how to implement crossing. It's a known matrix. For example, for ON, it's given by this. If you could read some n over 2s and some 1 over n's, it is just group theory that says how do we rotate the indices. And now this is the question. How do we deal with this type of problems? What's the maximum of some function? How do we maximize things? on the space of functions that obey these properties. What's the space of such, of such functions? Right? Now, you could say, in the same way that for one function, we had the maximum absolute value principle, that functions don't have maxima, is there a generalization when I have more functions, like some generalized maximum absolute value principle? Perhaps, but we don't know it. So is there some generalized mathematics we can use? We don't know. So what do we do to study this space? We just say, if I have a smooth function inside the disk, I make an ansatz for it. Like I make an ansatz with many Fourier modes. Like to describe the shape of a drum, you put many modes. Right? And then you say, find the boundary of this space. Namely, try to find how big these modes can be until I hit the boundary. Maximize things in various directions to find the walls of this space. OK? For example, if you have three channels, you could measure the S matrix at S equal T equal U. This would be like some effective four-point coupling. And you could measure the effective four-point coupling in the symmetric channel, anti-symmetric, and singlet. That's measure an effective four-point coupling in the three representations. Right? Or if there are poles, you could measure the poles of the residues. But if there are no poles, you could measure the effective four-point coupling, the S matrix that's the middle of the unit disk for the three channels. And then you could plot that space in three dimensions. And that was the answer to the last question. If I start doing this, for example, for ON, I plot the value of the effective couplings possible in three dimensions, or for Z4 symmetric theories, and we get these funny shapes just by looking at the solution to that mathematical problem that I described, where this space that apparently the mathematicians call them spectahedrons, the inside will describe possible quantum field theories. So gap, quantum field theories, ON symmetry, and no-bound states need to live inside this rock. And the ones outside the rock are impossible. They would violate unitarity. And that's what we would conclude. And there are many things that we don't understand. So let me just say a few ones. For example, this shape has edges, and it has cusps. It has kinks. Why? We don't know. It's just a solution, again, to that mathematical problem of maximizing functions with exactly this problem that I said here. Just this simple problem. Find the space of such functions. And the solution to that problem is cusps. 
What is more, you go to these cusps and you find known theories. For example, this blue cusp, if I remember correctly, is the O-N nonlinear sigma model that Zamologico found in 79. It's a theory that's integrable, that the scattering factorizes. Doesn't matter in which order you scatter it, obeys the so-called Young-Baxter equation. Where did Young-Baxter enter so far? Nowhere. It was totally not put in, and now suddenly there is a cusp which obeys Young-Baxter. No idea why. Why do we get these special points that suddenly start obeying Young-Baxter? One other cusp is free theory. It's the position 111. It's somewhere else. We have all these edges. We have a new point that was a missing solution of Young-Baxter that people had not found before. And that solution has some fun periodicity in energy. It looks like as you increase the energy that you scatter, things repeat itself like a fractal. And we don't know what the physics of that S-matrix could be. And there is really a lot to be understood here. So, so that's the answer to the last question. How does the space of gap S-matrix looks like? Here are some snapshots of something that we are definitely far from giving the total picture of what's going on. There are other questions that are within reach that we could have asked, like in gap theories, how do we use these computers, like I described before, to study these water-liquid phase transitions and so on. This was not our work. It was something that other people had done for the Ising model, where, as I said, promised, these computers, they find the best determination of these critical exponents, much better than Monte Carlo methods, say. Something that we did do with Andre and João was, for example, to ask in real-world QCD for pi -ans, we asked some questions about what's the possible space of pi and S matrices. And I can tell you more about the details, but we find there is a funny peninsula where zeros of pi and, where the, where the zeros of the pi and S matrix could live. It's already a more complicated question because they go to higher dimensions, as I said. And there are questions which are much harder, of course, which we'd like to explore. We described the simplest possible S matrix, two particles going to two particles. Quantum field theory is the set of all S matrices, n particles to n particles. But even three particles to three particles in two dimensions, like the simplest thing, the next to the simplest thing, we don't know yet how to do. The analytic properties are too complicated. I, I can't do, or two to three. I can't do any process beyond two to two. The analytic properties start to be already much more complicated. So this was the project I gave to Alexandre for his master project. And <laughs> I then realized it's way, way, way harder. So it's, I don't know how to, how, to, how to answer. It's good that he's not here, so he will not complain. Uh, <laughs> I think he doesn't know there is a colloquium. Yeah. <laughs> like I did not know. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, what is the S matrix of globals? Like we said in the beginning, that there are these stable globals. What happens when I scatter them? That would be super cool. And of course, if we can tame these questions and move into massless particles, like for these Goldstone particles, it will be very nice to study graviton S matrix and to try to see what constraints can we put into uh, scattering of, uh, of gravitons at the quantum level. So that's it. As we try to carve out the space between allowed theories and forbidden theories, there is this map. There are things that we would like to explore, places we would like to go, and we don't know everything at all about the uh, the many details that we can encounter, but there are many cool things that uh, we are finding. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Do we have uh, questions? There should be many questions. Oh, there's one here. So I have a stupid question, but S is less than one, but what's the rest of what are the other scattering? Is it just free scattering? The ones that so S S dagger should be equal one, the complete S, right? Sorry, can you repeat? The complete S matrix should satisfy S S dagger equals one. That's right. So you're just computing one element of the S matrix. Right. So S S dagger equal to one as a matrix, it implies that the S matrix of two particles going into X particles, if I sum over all possible final states is equal to 1, right? So it means that if I just do 2 to 2 square, the rest is positive. I put it on the other side, and it's smaller than 1. I see. So, and you haven't thought so, about doing S2 to other things? Oh, that was what I said. That I was see. the project okay. I gave Alexandria. Yeah. Further questions? Shame, shame on him, yeah. <laughs> so Anna has a question. So for this ON case, like all these cusps are in, like you found integrable theories or just some of them like 
Is there any kind of pattern or? Yeah, here we put this point. It doesn't look really like a cusp. We don't know yet if it's a cusp. This doesn't obey Young Baxter. The other ones, they all obey Young Baxter. Okay. We don't know this cusp yet. I mean, uh, maybe now we do. I mean, Lucy and Ife, they are running some more numerics. Yeah, this is not published yet. We are zooming in on this region. This plot was done with, I don't know, maybe 600,000 points. And uh, we are putting a few more thousand close to that point to zoom in and to see the shape of that region. OK. But, so, but the ones that are very much cusps, they obey Young Baxter. OK. And we and don't know why. You put this Z4, Z4 and then you didn't mention? Like what? Yeah, I did not describe much about Z4. But let me say a few words. So Z4 has this very funny shape. It was a surprise when this shape came out. And all theories at the boundary of this funny shape obey Young-Baxter. So the full boundary, it's a two-dimensional deformation that obeys Young-Baxter, that factorizes. And it can be identified as an S matrix that's homologic of also had conjecture. And in particular, this, blue, this green line, it's, a, it's when there is an edge. So this line is more special. And this describes the scattering of kinks of St. Gordon. So we described the breeders before, but the kinks, these twists of the belt, when they scatter, the S matrix corresponds to that green line over there, which is a degenerate limit of, of this Z4 zomologic of S matrix. Oh, OK, so have a nice presentation. Uh, I, I have a question about the flux tube case. When, when you increase the dimension, should we expect uh, extra complication related to the analytic properties of this matrix as well? You talked about algebraic property because it's, it's a matrix, right? It's not a function anymore. But even the analytical structure should not be more complicated? No. So here be careful. that The flux tube is one dimensional object. That doesn't matter what the target space is. So if you are in four dimensions, what does it mean? You have a tube of energy, and you can move it like this or like this. So there are one direction, two directions. Okay. So there are two transverse modes. So it's like you have particle of type one and of type two, and they move on a line. So it's still two-dimensional, but with indices for the type of particles. I see, I see. So that fits perfectly in this picture that I said before, where I have a, this type of thing. I have extra indices for the type of particles, but it's still function of center mass energy. Where things get more complicated is for example, with the pions that we did with Andrea. That's really hardcore computations to get this. Because here, the analytic structures are much harder. Because now we are dealing with a function that depends on the energy and the angle as well. And that you really need other type of mathematics. It, it's more complicated. Thank you. So, so you just follow up uh, on, I was going to ask about this. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're saying that, uh, okay, what, what you today, today uh, you were heavily using uh, properties of uh, analytic functions, right? Mm -hmm. C and so on. Now, can you tell us that for the flux tube, you can think of these two dimensions. We include pions, so you have more variables. So is that, uh, so can you comment on what uh, what, uh, what's new when you try to do that? Uh, yeah, what, what you... so the key thing that's new is the following. So when you have pions, now you have an angle. So now there is a tension between two fundamental principles, crossing and unitarity. So you could say that let me make an ansatz where my function, the space of functions I describe, is automatically symmetric under swapping S, T, and U, for example, right? All Mandelstam variables. That's possible to do. That's even easy to do. But then, how do you measure unitarity? You have to pick a channel, decompose into partial waves. Then uh, what you have is each partial wave. What's a partial wave? It's saying, what's the probability amplitude of scattering two particles with total angular moment of seven? Angular moment is conserved, so you get seven in the end, and it's like a function just of the energy. So you have, in higher dimensions, an infinite set of one-dimensional problems, one per spin. Right? So for each of them, uh, it's the same business. It's just unitarity, smaller than one, everywhere. But you have an extra linear map that maps you from a crossing symmetric ansatz to each partial wave. And that's a linear operation. It's projecting into partial waves. But let linear operation is an, a, a, a technical complication in, a, in higher dimensions. So you make a crossing symmetric smooth and that's. You have a kernel that projects it into partial waves. And for each partial wave, it's probability smaller than one. Right? So numerical, it's like the same complexity as one dimension <laughs> times 
as many spins you consider. So the number of parameters grows much more. But, but you were doing low energies, or can you argue that uh, S wave dominates or something? That's often the case, that what happens, that not S wave, but uh, S equals zero, one, and two. The first few spins end up dominating. But uh, it's crucial to keep all spins to restore crossing symmetry, right? So if you want to have a fully crossing symmetric ansatz, you can't just truncate into a few spins. Because to reproduce a singularity in the T channel from a few S channel spins, you can never reproduce a singularity. So immediately you need all singularities if you want to reproduce singularities in one channel from the other channel. So, yeah, because it's really not just low energy. So if you add uh, supersymmetry, you give you more restrictions on the S matrix? Yeah, that's the paper we are finishing with uh, Matteo uh, Fabri and uh, Carlos Bersini. So it's another picture that I could have added here. It's going to be, uh, actually, it's going to be in this other paper that we said. So this paper here, it started with supersymmetry. And then we asked the question, what happens? What's special about supersymmetry? We said supersymmetry in two dimensions is like Z2 symmetry. Because in two dimensions, you can't distinguish a boson from a fermion. A fermion is like a Z2 odd particle, and a boson is a Z2 even. Right? There is no polarization, no little group. In two dimensions, because you don't have space to smoothly swap them, you need to have them add on. There is no adiabatics smoothly changing bosons and fermions. And so we thought, OK, but then Z2 symmetry or supersymmetry is very similar. So we would ask, how is our supersymmetric theories that are more special embedded into Zn symmetric theories? And uh, so that's what we did. So indeed, Zn uh, supersymmetry restricts further the space. And for example, when we ask the same questions that I asked that gave rise to sine Gordon, we will find a supersymmetric sine Gordon, for example, if we add supersymmetry. Yeah. So one more question. So it seems that if you start uh, trying to do this for three particles, it becomes really hard. That's so do you think in sense. some future we'll be able to do to compare the S matrix for the standard model or not? Uh, well, that's much harder. I would like to carve out the space of two-dimensional quantum field theories. Two-dimensional non-integrable quantum field theory. Now, that's already, I think, very nice. But so I, I, I'm, yeah, for me, I would have that first ambition, just two-dimensional, even gapped, two-dimensional gapped non-integrable quantum field theories. I think that would be already very nice. And if you see that, if you have two dimensions, how many variables do we have when you have n particles? It's n minus 3, right? So because just you subtract the dimension of the Lorentz group. So you subtract the boosts and translations. So four particles, n minus 3 is one variable. Five particles, it's two variables. It's not that much more complicated. And 3 to 3 would be three Lorentz time invariants. So it's three variables. So the number of variables grows slowly. Each time you add one more particle, it's one more Lorentz invariant. So it's not that complicated. But yet, you have so many cuts and pulls opening up that we could not tame it yet. All right. So if there are no more questions, uh, we can thank Pedro again. <laughs>